So, uh, welcome to this presentation. Um, I'm happy to present you um, Charlie with the topic Hacking between Crime, Craft and Culture. Um, this time uh, the English version. And uh, Charlie is one attendant of our um, uh, science center of the SFN uh, since a few years. And she's done uh, many things. Uh, uh, especially with uh, computers and uh, programming and so on, software types. And uh, yeah, today she will uh, talk about uh, the, the topic uh, happy hacking. And so I will, uh, yeah, Charlie, it's your turn. Thank you very if you, much. Yeah. Yes, hello, my name is Charlie. And today I want to take a look behind the a common image that we have of hacking and who hackers really are. And this talk is going to be structured into four parts. First, we'll take a little history lesson and look at where the image that we have of hackers come, came from. Then we will um, see whether there is any truth to this image. And um, next, we will see if there is anything that this uh, hacking has to do with politics. And lastly, I want to take a look at the hacking scene in Germany, especially. Um, so how it all began? Well, our origins of hacking can be found in the 1950s. Of course, computers had, um, had existed for way longer than that. But um, this is the, the time where we commonly say that hacking had its origin. And it was at the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, with their tech model Wayway Club. This was a club for people who were enthusiastic about model trains. And um, what these people did was that they took their model trains and noticed that there are some electrical components that they could um, maybe start to play around with. They could modify their circuits. So they tried to implement um, new things they try to introduce some switches to the uh, to their main boards and whenever they successfully completed such a modification they called it a hack so this is where the word comes from and what we can see is that at this time it had a very positive connotation so um, hacking was not something that was viewed negatively but what we also see, and what is uh, something that we'll see from time time again, is that um, a hack is something that is done quickly, that is not necessarily pretty or production ready, but something that just works. It just has to work somehow. But uh, of course, today we know that there is not as much such a positive image of hackers or hacking. And um, this did change in the late 60s, early 70s with the telephone frequency. Those were people that started to try to modify or abuse the telephone system. So the way telephones worked back then were that if I wanted to call a certain person, I would uh, dial their number and then I would be, uh, my call would be routed through a telephone switch or a central office that would then forward my call on. And uh, in the central office, the, the pricing of the telephone calls were handled because those calls were very expensive back then, and um, especially long distance calls, um, where long distance could mean just across the street. So calling someone was really, really expensive. So these telephone freakers tried to find a way to to call someone without having to pay for it. And what they noticed was that telephones um, communicate with each other through signals. And those signals are just frequencies or tones at a certain, certain pitch. And um, there was one tone that these hackers found or these freakers found over time, which um, basically simulated to the, to the central office that the call had already ended and the um, so you could continue to your call without having to pay for it. And this was done through 
this one frequency, it was 2,600 hertz. So the, they started to introduce what they, what they called blue boxes, this, uh, these devices that you could just plug into your phone and then it would play that certain frequency and allowed you to make free calls. Um, what is interesting is that um, this happened, I think, twice or three times that um, there was a, a children's flute, a toy like this, where someone found out that it had exactly the right frequency to make free calls. One of them was included in a kid's cereal. So once this got known, this special type of cereal went out of stock really, really quickly because everyone used this toy flute to make cheap calls. Of course, this was not legal. Um, it's called, um, yeah, uh, toll evasion, I think, and, um, or toll fraud. And these people did it anyway because they wanted to make free calls. So we can see that at around this time, the media started to pick up on, on this movement and the negative image of the hacker started to become uh, more popular. So once we move into the late 70s, early 1980s, we can see that a scene starts to emerge, a hacking scene. And there are three groups of people that are at the center of this new scene. First of all is the GNU project. Um, the GNU project was a group of people who wanted to make a free operating system, operating system like what we use today, it might be Windows or Linux. And the, at that time, prevailing operating system was called Unix. So they wanted to make an alternative to that, which was completely free. Free did not just mean <clears throat> uh, that it didn't cost anything, but also that it was free to use for everyone or um, free to get the source code, the uh, source code of the programs and to modify them. And uh, it was called GNU. What is also interesting, but not really relevant for this topic is this GNU in this case is what we call a recursive acronym. So when you ask what, uh, I don't know if there's any talk. But, um, ah, when you ask what does GNU stand for, the answer would be news not Unix. So it has itself in its uh, acronym. So you can ask time and time again, well, what is GNU? Well, GNU is not Unix. Um, so this is, yeah, we call that a recursive acronym. Um, the next part, and there's a lot of overlap between these two scenes. Um, there's a lot of overlap between these two things is the Free Software Foundation, a group of people who also wanted to spread uh, free software. So again, software that was open for everyone to access and to modify. And none of these two scenes would have gotten as big as they did without the home computing scene. So before that, uh, there were, of course, computers, but they were mostly stationed at universities or research, um, research organizations because they were very expensive and very like, just unpractical and heavy. But uh, around that time, people started to have computers in their own homes. So um, more and more people started to wonder, well, what, is, what can we do with this new toy or this new, new um, machine that we have lying around? And they tried to push the boundaries of what their system was capable of. So these three things together, or these three groups together, um, made up the then growing hacking scene. And again, we can see that there is much more a focus on, uh, on one, for once the, the political or general aspect of free software, but also uh, just playing around with what you have given and trying to modify your system. Um, between then and now, a few things happened that started to um, make the image that we have today of hackers much more negative. And these things were mainly media, so newspapers, 
or pop culture, so movies. We know a lot of movies where hacking is displayed in a very, very stereotypical way. Um, so the image we have today is generally a negative one and um, it portrays hackers as criminals who try to break into systems for their own gain. And what we get out of that is what I like to call a stock image hacker, because it is when you look around at stock, in, stock image pages, you can find these very nice uh, depictions of what a stereotypical hacker looks like. So we have someone breaking into their computer or the uh, like console with green text. But of course, there, this, this kind of image doesn't come out of nowhere. So it is a valid question to ask ourselves, is there any truth to this image? And what we can see is that there is not actually just one, but rather two separate images we have. First, we have the um, good hacker, that would be the ones at the MIT or the GNU project. And we have the bad ones that are more representative of the image we have today um, or generally um, what we see in movies. So the good hackers are what we call white hat hackers. And these are generally regarded as very competent in their field. So that could be coding, that could be electronics, anything that yeah, that they would be very competent in. And these people always act within legal boundaries, so they never break the law. And their aim is to improve systems that we have in place. This could be operating systems or generally some programs, but this could also be social or political systems. And we have two very good examples of people that fall in this category. This is Linus Torvalds. Some of you might have seen him already. Um, he is the founder of the Linux kernel. So basically the core of every operating or Linux based operating system we use today, which also includes your Android phones. So we have him to thank because he was curious and started to, to wonder what he can do with his computer. So this is where we got. And the other Example is Constanze Kurz. She is a spokesperson for the CCC, the Chaos Computer Club, which we will talk about later in more detail. But she's generally also a very competent uh, coder and she works in IT security and tries to improve more generally the, the state of digitalization and um, everything that surrounds that or IT security in Germany because as some of you might know, we lag a little bit behind when it comes to such affairs. On the other side, we have the bad ones that are representative of the image that we have of them today or what we see in movies, as I said. And those are people that try to gain access to other systems, to foreign systems, and are generally destructive in nature. So they try to break things, they steal data, they corrupt or destroy data. And they are usually working for personal gain. So they might um, steal your data and uh, have you pay money to get it back. And um, a lot of people say that this form of hacking should be called cracking, just to make a clear cut difference between these hackers and the good ones. Others do not agree with that because as we will see in a second that um, there is no such clear cut boundary between those two groups. One person that could be regarded as an example for that is Kevin Mitnick. He is one of the most famous hackers. And in his early years, in his youth, he gained access to a lot of systems he wasn't supposed to, just mainly for fun. And he did land in prison for that. Um, but right now uh, he works as a IT security expert for many big firms and companies. So he did change his way. But in his early years, we can say that he falls into this category. And generally in the hacking community, people that fall into this category are not accepted. They are not very well regarded because they work for their person and gain. What we do see is that there is a certain gray area between those two groups. And this is where most of the hackers that we 
see in, in, in the news, for example, fall in. And the defining feature of this group is the belief that there is a fundamental difference between legality and morality. So you can move well outside the legal realm, so you can break the law if what you do adheres to a certain moral standard. And one really good example for this would be WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks, as some of you probably have heard of, is a platform where leaked documents are posted. Those documents always um, regard affairs of public interest. So it, those are documents that maybe show corruption scandals of politicians or tax evasion by big companies. And uh, the idea behind that is that this is data that is of very much public re relevance so that this data should be free for everyone to access. You would never find your neighbor's personal information on a site such as WikiLeaks. Um, another aspect or another thing where these, this difference between legality and morality comes into play is what we call bounty hunting. Um, and it basically means that there are some people, some hackers that go out and try to find security flaws in different systems. So I could maybe go out and look at Google's homepage and try to find a way to steal everyone's passports. Uh, passwords. And um, what I could do now is I could go onto Twitter and post, well, guys, look, this is the security flaw I found. Um, the problem with that would be that then there could be people with malicious intent, some of the bad hackers, as we would call them, who go and say, oh, well, there's a, a security flaw, let's steal all the people's passwords. So what these bounty hunters usually do is uh, called responsible disclosure. The other thing would be full disclosure. And when I do a responsible disclosure, I go to the company, for example, Google, and say, well, I found this security flaw in your system, and I will give you two months to fix it. And if by that time you have not done anything to fix that issue, then I will then I will uh, open it up to the public. So you can build up pressure to the company to fix their issues, but also protect the people's pr uh, private data. And most big companies really encourage this thing because they want uh, they want their security flaws to be noticed by people who won't um, act in malicious intent. So they put a lot of price money out for people who find these security issues. So this is generally a very good thing and a win-win situation. But um, to, to find these security flaws, you usually need to break into the system which is in most cases, there are some legal edge cases, but in generally is not legal. So you could, um, you could be sued for uh, bounty hunting. And there is a really interesting example that is very recent and that went through the news a lot in the last few months. And this is the one of Lilith Wittmann versus the CDU. <clears throat> Lilith is a hacker who works voluntarily um, for the Chaos Computer Club. She's a very um, engaged person there and she's very um, very active in a lot of these fields and also in the field of bounty hunting or IT security research. <clears throat> and what she did is she found out that there is a security flaw in an app that the CDU uses. This app allows them to record um, record conversations they had in um, with people on when they walk around from house to house to um, pursue them of the uh, of, of electing that city so it is an election campaign app as you could call it and I I'll have to make a shorten it up so if you want to look into it feel free to do so because it is a really interesting story but um, I'm sorry, short, she found a security flaw that allowed her to gain access to very personal data, such as age, gender, um, address, and also political affiliations of some people. So very sensitive 
person that and she went to the um the the cdu and the uh, the um, persons that were responsible for this app and did a responsible disclosure and um then the security issue was fixed so in generally this is exactly what should happen but then the cdu went ahead and said well you broke into our system so that means that we can sue you and they tried to sue Lilith Wittmann. Um, of course, this uh, call or this this um, led to a lot of public outrage because the CDU basically profited from her voluntary work. So um, there would be no reason for them to sue Lilith, especially since she had disclosed the the weakness in their system to them. Uh, so there was a lot of public pressure that built up on the CDU and they revoked um, their uh, legal legal threats. But in general, this is something that can happen um, and that, that might happen to some people. But again, I want to emphasize that if you if attackers step out of these legal boundaries, they are still usually in almost all cases follow this um, strong moral code. and. This is also um, the core idea of the hacker ethic. It's, um, this was formulated in the 1980s and expanded upon in the late 1980s again. And uh, this is just a, an excerpt of that, but it basically provides a common basic ground that all hackers have to agree on if they want to be in the scene, so a basic concept. So uh, the first idea is that access to computers and anything which might teach you something about the way the world works should be unlimited and total because computers are such a powerful tool and um, we gain so much from using them that they should not only be uh, able to be used by a few people but rather by many. And um, the next point is a very, very interesting one because it relates to um, two basic ideas. It says mistrust authority, promote decentralization. First of all, it is a political aspect, which, will, um, which we will see later on again. But also it is a, um, a very practical idea, because if I have a system, maybe a system of many servers and computers, and I have one central authority, so one computer or one server that controls the whole system. I can just, or someone can go and attack this one computer and then the whole system fails. This is what we call a single point of failure and we generally want to avoid such a thing. Um, so this is basically the principle on which the internet works. You can uh, destroy or attack as many servers as as you want, the internet as a system will still work. And um, so generally, we don't want single points of failure. We don't want single authorities. This could also um, be relevant if you talk about data, because I have, if I have one authority, let's say Facebook, who owns all your data, they can basically do whatever they want with that data, because there is no other um, controlling factors that uh, would come into play. And this is basically what Facebook does, or Google, or any big corporation in that matter. Uh, next point is very self-explanatory. Hackers should be judged by their acting, not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, sex, or position. It's generally just the aim to be a very inclusive um, scene. And the last two points are, you can create art and beauty on a computer. So this point was mainly added to combat the image of hackers being destructive, destructive or always trying to break into things or break things, but um, that computers are very much a, a tool which can be used in many different ways. And the last, last point is another very important one, which we already saw in the um, WikiLeaks example, which says make public data available, protect private data. Hackers will never try to, if, if they follow the hacker ethic and fall into either the white hat or the gray hat, 
uh, zone, they will never steal anyone's private personal information. This is a home effect, as you can say in the scene. But public data, one that relates to companies, to politicians, this is something that will be gained access to and will be made available for the public to use. So knowing all of this, we can maybe ask ourselves, or maybe not, whether or what it has to do with politics. People that know me know that I tend to talk a lot about politics and generally try to make everything about politics. But um, in this case, I do believe that I have a point here. Because hacking is and has always been a political affair. And there are some people who, in this scene, do not want to believe that. And there are a few different beliefs. But I believe very strongly in the fact that hacking is and always has been political. We can see this in the um, 1980s, for example, where there was a lot of political activism towards free and open data. But this has a few reasons, I think. And the first one is that hackers have power. Knowing how to hack, knowing how to break into other people's systems or computers gives you a lot of power. And with that comes responsibility. So if you can get access to other people's data or companies' data, you need to make a decision on how to use that power and how to, what to do with it with this um, with this data you have access to, which data to publish and which data not to publish. And um, this is generally, as we can say, a political question um, because data in itself is something political. Um, this is very obvious when it comes to uh, relate data about your maybe personal political affiliations, but everything that Google, Facebook own about your pr private data is political in nature because they can use that for and against you. So um, knowing or having access to certain data and deciding what to do with it is a political question. Um, the maybe even more uh, valid point here is that there always have been very strong connections between the hacking scene and the anarchist scene. Um, and what is really interesting is that both of these scenes are both very stereotypicalized in many aspects or are, are portrayed in a very stereotypical nature. And um, we already talked about the idea that hacking wants to promote decentralization or mistrust authority which is a core belief of the, the anarchist ideology. So um, there are, I can't go into too much detail here, but there are a lot of connections in the way both these ideologies or these groups work, but also in the way um, they are usually regarded and portrayed in media because both of these are discredited very uh, often or they are not taken seriously in their aim because they there is such a strong image of them. And the last point I want to make in this uh, section is that there is no such thing as being unpolitical or apolitical, especially as a group. If you have the aim to be inclusive, inclusive, which it is stated in the hacker ethic, you want to be, you need to be anti-racist, you need to be anti-fascist, you need to be anti-homophobic and all these things um, in order to guarantee a safe environment of, for any person, regardless of things such as race, age, sex, and, and all these different things. And um, knowing this, we can maybe see why there's a lot of scapegoating or blaming these uh, hackers for things because as we can see in the media there is this negative image and this is not not i don't want to say this is the entire reason but there's definitely a part in here where hackers are the epitomes so they symbolize decentralization autonomy and anti-authoritarianism and these are all things that are of a certain danger to people in, in 
power or generally to prevailing political systems. Um, and what adds to that is that hackers again have the, uh, or some hackers have the possibility to access certain information and usually politicians in power have data, have information that they want to want to be kept secret or private. So hackers pose a very real threat to the current system, which we can also see in the connections to the anarchist theme, who also pose a threat to the um, to the current political system by not accepting it. But um, also this real possibility of information getting out to the public that they don't want to be released. And one tactic that is used to combat this, um, this threat is the one of discrediting or diversion. So I can have two, two separate headlines. One headline could read, well, some people under legal risks um, went ahead and found out data that shows that politicians are corrupt. This is a headline that most politicians would not want to read because they don't want the, polit uh, the, the public to know that they are corrupt, I'm not saying that every politician is corrupt, of course. Um, but the headline they would much rather read is that, well, those criminal hackers try to, um, try to gain access to our system again, but we will work hard to, to pursue them. So um, if hackers are displayed as criminal in nature, their points do not need to be taken so seriously because the fact that they are hackers is enough to discredit them, to make their arguments not relevant anymore. So all of this culminates in the group Anonymous, which is something or a group that most of you probably have already heard of. And we can again see the connections between hacking and anarchism. Um, <clears throat> because Anonymous is organized in an, in an anarchist manner. So it is basically an anarchist hacking organization that tries to, um, to target people that abuse power. So that is the whole idea of Anonymous. And what I mean with uh, anarchist organizations is that there is no leading structure. No, no single person is the leader of a anonymous or is responsible for anonymous actions. It is just a group of people who come together to make these uh, hacking, hacking actions that are also very political in nature. So um, I want to conclude this, this uh, presentation with a short look into the hacking scene in Germany. And I want to uh, start off with an entirely new definition of what a hacker is. It says, a hacker is someone that tries to find a way to make toast using a coffee machine. And first of all, this might seem very strange because what does that have to do with hacking? But we can find many of these aspects that we um, talk or that we that we heard of today in this uh, in this sentence because it shows the aim of pushing boundaries pushing technical as well as you could um, you could very well imagine this being about pushing legal boundaries or socio political boundaries but in this case it is just pushing the boundaries of whatever you can do with a coffee machine. And um, another thing it shows is the, the idea of trying to use what you have given. You could just as well buy a toaster and, use, and, and make your toast using a toaster, but uh, it wouldn't be as much fun. And this playful nature is something that is found a lot in the hacking team. Hackers love their toys. That could be a computer, but give a hacker some, some blinking lights and he'll be satisfied for quite a while. So we can find all of these aspects on this idea of doing it yourself and just going ahead and trying out these things in this new definition. So it is 
one that I quite like. And also we um, maybe know of the, the usage of the word life hack. And it, under this definition, it is very much a certain form of hacking. And um, so I found, found this, this a really interesting, interesting formulation. And it was um, formulated in the early 1980s by a person called Bau Holland. And he is one of the founders of the CCC, the Chaos Computer Club. Uh, which is basically an organization that does a lot of educational work in um, in Germany, as well as political activism, political activism, um, mainly regarding IT security or the state of digitalization or anything that that is in that direction. Um, this is what we call the Chaos Knot. It is the logo, I hope you can see it. Um, and the CCC is organized decentrally. This means that there are, are in almost every major city, you will have a local um, local variant of the Chaos Computer Club, um, where people come together and just be there, nerd around. But this can also be a kind of social space. In Kassel, we have the flip dot hacker space. And all these single groups are loosely connected to the CCC, but not necessarily, um, yeah, they don't need to follow any orders or something from this, this, um, this, yeah, from the CCC. And there are also no leaders, just spokespeople. We saw Constanze Kurz earlier, and another one that um, is very well known is Linus Neumann. He is often, uh, for example, when there is a new law that is about to be introduced, he is called into the Bundestag as an expert to assess whether this law would make sense. Um, if, it, uh, if it is about things like um, internet digitalization, IT security, anything like that. And around the CCC, there is a lot of culture. Um, ah, all right. And uh, the maybe biggest part where we see this culture in action is at the Chaos Communication Congress. This is a Congress and event that takes place every year between Christmas and New Year's. And there are each year about 16,000 people that come together. It used to be in Hamburg and now it is in Leipzig at the Congress Center Leipzig and come together and just be there. There are a lot of um, talks or uh, presentations about political, about uh, hack themes, uh, about hacking, about electronics, about anything you might imagine. Um, and there is like a new, new motto each year. This was the 33rd, uh, third, the 35th, or this was the 18th uh, case communication congress. Each year there is a lo new logo. This one is a very famous one, the star with the keyboard. And um, we can again see if you are on this event, um, there you will notice that it is very political. You will have a lot of political um, themes and generally um, talks in there. But also if we look at, I think it was the eighth Congress, it already had the motto open borders. So that is something that has always been in this scene. And uh, it is generally, in my opinion, a very wonderful uh, event. And you, do not have to be a, an expert in IT security and com computers at all. I know a lot of people who are there um, just just being there, just having a, a group, a peer group, uh, which they need there. So, or just enjoying the event because it is a really, really intense, but really great experience um, in my opinion. And you can really see that there are two different movements or groups in this uh, hacking scene. There are, 
um, those people who still believe that you need to be a real hacker to participate in these events and that there is something such as a real hacker. And those are people who often try to gatekeep this community, which means that they uh, won't let everybody in. You need to prove your worth to them in some sense. So you need to be use, you need to use a Linux system, preferably Arch Linux with an i3 window manager that doesn't have to tell you anything. But um, there is this idea that you have to do or be certain certain things to prove yourself to the community, to be part of it, to be a hacker. But um, there is also a very strong and active movement that um, goes in the opposite direction and which I, I enjoy really much. This is a, in my opinion, very diverse, generally with younger community within the hacking community, very political, very queer, and very just trying to make the scene accessible for everyone. So um, there are still issues and there is still this, um, this divide between certain people in the community. So there is not everything, is not everything great, but in general, the, uh, these events showcase a very wide range of people, which I really much enjoy. And um, there are a few, few other ones, um, such as the GPN, the Gulag Programmiernach, which is basically the summer version of the Congress, but with a lot fewer people, like one or 2,000 each year, and um, the Easter Hack, which changes location every year. But as we can see, and why I included this, is um, that these events also have this kind of political nature. For example, this was in the year 2019, where Article 13, which you probably have heard of, emerged and uh, was basically yeah, started to, to come into, um, into, into place. So um, this was the whole situation regarding upload filters and all of this. And so the the, uh, the event revolved in parts around that. This is the entire text of the Article 13 law. Um, yeah, so I, I would like to, to conclude with um, the idea that we already talked about, that hacking is not a negative thing. Most hackers are very much the opposite. They act according to very strong moral um, moral ideas, moral frameworks. And um, there is a really great, amazing hacking scene out there that um, is worth checking out in my belief. So um, I think that concludes it for my part. I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, Charlie, for your presentation. Um, and are there uh, questions online or at the place? You can uh, speak or you can uh, talk, uh, you can uh, write something in the chat if you want. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I uh, will. Uh, uh, thank you again, Charlie, for this uh, very interesting uh, new look on this topic, hacking. And then I will wish uh, all uh, attendants a nice day. And uh, I also can advise uh, the other uh, presentations we have today. Uh, so if you want and you have a bit of time, you can uh, yeah, look some or uh, watch some one next. Okay, so have a nice day.